It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. Hey guys, Tyler here. There's no shadow of doubt that the most famous miracle of all time is by far the ability of walking on water. And for today's episode, compared to mythology, we're going to explore the question, where does this idea of walking on water come directly from in ancient civilization? The most famous person by far that ever walked on water is without a doubt Jesus Christ, because according to Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 to 33, it says, Immediately, Jesus made a disciple get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went on the mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already considerable distance from land, buffeted by the winds because the winds was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out of fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, let me come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down in the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? Now when it comes down to dating the New Testament, we know that Matthew is by far the earliest of the Gospels. In fact, it can be dated back roughly around 70 uh, AD. Now when it comes down to the later Gospels, like you know the book of John, we do know that it can be dated back roughly around uh, 90 uh, AD. So what exactly are stories that actually predate the Gospels and Hellenistic culture that has people walking on water or the gods just walking on water. Now, one of the most famous examples so far comes directly from the Odyssey. And what happens in the Odyssey is that basically the character named Hermes has the absolute capability of walking on water without any type of issue. So he spoke, and the guide, Agiepontes, did not fail to obey. At once he bound beneath his feet his beautiful sandals, immortal, golden, which bore him over the waters of the sea and over the boundless land, swift as the blasts of the wind. Another example of this is Virgil's the Aeneid, where the character Mercury also has the capability of walking on water with sandals. Mercury leapt to obey the great father's order. First he bound his golden sandals on, which, winged, carry him high over land or sea with the same dispatch. The Aeneid was written down roughly around 30 BCE, and that the Odyssey was written down roughly around the 7th century BCE. However, there is one story I find the most fascinating of the bunch, and it happens to be the god Orion. Orion, a hunter of Boeotian Iria, and the handsomest man alive, was the son of Poseidon and Eurali. Coming one day to Hyria in Chios, he fell in love with Merope, daughter of Dionysus' son, Oenopion. Oenopion had promised Merope to Orion in marriage if he would free the island from the dangerous wild beasts that infested it, and this he set himself to do, bringing the pelts to Merope every evening. But when the task was at last accomplished, and he claimed her as his wife, Onopian brought him rumours of lions, bears, and wolves still lurking in the hills, and refused to give her up, the fact being that he was in love with her himself. One night Orion, in disgust, drank a skinful of Onopian's wine, which so inflamed him that he broke into Merope's bedroom and forced her to lie with him. When dawn came, Onopian invoked his father Dionysus, who sent satyrs to ply Orion with still more wine until he fell fast asleep, whereupon Onopian put out both his eyes and flung him on the seashore. An oracle announced that the blind man would regain his sight if he travelled to the east and turned his eye sockets towards Helios at the point where he first rises from the ocean. Orion at once rowed out to sea in a small boat and following the sound of a cyclops's hammer reached Lemnos, 
There he entered the smithy of Hephaestus, snatched up an apprentice named Cadalian, and carried him off on his shoulders as a guide. Cadalian led Orion over land and sea, until he came at last to the farthest ocean, where Eos fell in love with him, and her brother Helios duly restored his sight. After visiting Delos in Eos's company, Orion returned to avenge himself on Ornapion, whom he could not, however, find anywhere in Chios, because he was hiding in an underground chamber made for him by Hephaestus. Sailing on to Crete, where he thought that Ornapion might have fled for protection to his grandfather Minos, Orion met Artemis, who shared his love of the chase. She soon persuaded him to forget his vengeance, and instead come hunting with her. Now, Apollo was aware that Orion had not refused Eos's invitation to her couch in the holy island of Delos. Dawn still daily blushes to remember this indiscretion, and further boasted that he would rid the whole earth of wild beasts and monsters. Fearing, therefore, that his sister Artemis might prove as susceptible as Eos, Apollo went to Mother Earth and, mischievously repeating Orion's boast, arranged for a monstrous scorpion to pursue him. Orion attacked the scorpion, first with arrows, then with his sword, but finding that its armour was proof against any mortal weapons, dived into the sea and swam away in the direction of Delos, where, he hoped, Eos would protect him. Apollo then called to Artemis, Do you see that black object bobbing about in the sea, far away, close to Ortigia? It is the head of a villain called Candion, who has just seduced Opus, one of your Hyperborean priestesses. I challenge you to transfix it with an arrow. Now Candion was Orion's Boeotian nickname, though Artemis did not know this. She took careful aim, let fly, and swimming out to retrieve her quarry, found that she had shot Orion through the head. In great grief, she implored Apollo's son Asclepius to revive him, and he consented, but was destroyed by Zeus's thunderbolt before he could accomplish his task. Artemis then set Orion's image among the stars, eternally pursued by the scorpions. His ghost had already descended to the asphodel fields. So the question then becomes, what exactly are some ancient examples of Orion walking on water? Hesiod said that he was the son of Aureli, the daughter of Minos and of Poseidon, and that it was given him a gift of power of walking upon the waves as though upon land. In the Library of Apollodorus, it says right here that Poseidon bestowed on him the power of sliding across the sea. Virgil continues to say, Like tall, Orion went on foot he goes through the deep sea and lifts his shoulders high above the waves. One final example comes directly from the book that's called Miracles in Greco-Roman Antiquity that was written down by Wendy Cotter. It is said once while crossing the river together with many of his friends, he, Pythagoras, greeted it the river, and the river responded in a voice so audible and distinct that everyone heard, Greeting to you, Pythagoras. Socrates, he said in an interrogator, you know perfectly well that all of men under the sun that man Zagoras is the most powerful and might not whip inferior to the gods themselves, who is able to accomplish the seemingly impossible, if it should be his will, to have men walk dry soul over the sea, to sail over the mountains, to drain rivers dry by drinking, or have you not heard that Zagoras, the king of the Persians, separating Otto's from the mainland, and that it led his infantry through the sea, riding upon a chariot like Poseidon and Hermos' descriptions. On the eighth day, we came in sight of many men running over the sea, like us in every way, both in shape and in size, except their feet, which were of cork, this is why they were called cork feet, if not mistaken, we were amazed to see that they did not go under, but stay on top of the waves and went about it fearfully. In conclusion, it seems as though that what the gospel writers are doing when they refer to Jesus walking on water is that they're trying to say that Jesus is better than Orion, that Jesus is better than Mercury, and that Jesus is also better than Hermes. So what do you guys think about these comparisons? Tell me in the comment section down below, and as always, I'll see you guys 
in the next video on comparative mythology. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. He's your only black friend, so he's your best black friend. I wouldn't trade him for another black friend. Because black friends are rare, as you should be aware. He smiles like Richard Pryor, so just sit and stare. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler.